Megan. Okay, I have a bubbly sermon here. Not really. Uh, my thinking is counterintuitive, and it's because it's thinking a little bit against the culture. We live in a time of identity crisis. You know, it used to be simple. Uh, who you were was related to the role you had. You were married or you were single, you had this particular job or that job, or you lived in this place or that place. And, you know, you could identify yourself in these rather simple ways. But life has become more complex. We live in a fast-changing world, and the culture changes. And sometimes you have to reinvent yourself. You know, even to get a new job, you have to kind of reinvent yourself or reinvent your career. And this is the world we live in. I think of my grandfather. Um, grew up in a small town in southern Ohio, and he moved to the big town of Toledo, and he started to work for Owens uh, glass company. He worked for the same company his whole life until he retired. I believe he was in his late 60s and it became Owens, Illinois. But he, and then my father, he went to Ohio State University, got his law degree after he was in the Korean War and uh, moved to Toledo because my mother told him to, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> he was from Columbus, so they made the big move from Columbus to Toledo. He worked for the same law firm for his whole career until he was 70. They went to the same church. They lived in the same house. They had the same friends. And he was on the same board of the same hospital for 40-some years. He didn't change anything. Take the bus downtown. The bus came from across the street. We had a lot of old cars. I don't know. Dad could have afforded a new car, but he liked the old ones. And he liked things not to change. I think that, uh, you know, by the time I was 30, I'd already lived in, I don't know, about 10 different places and 10 different apartments. In fact, I used to joke that I lived on the same street in two different states, but they pronounced it different. You know, New Englanders have a different way of pronouncing everything. So in New England, I lived on, ha how do they say it? Haverhill. Haverhill. But in Detroit, it was Haverhill. Same exact street, one place pronounced the H and the other one kind of dropped the H. You know, they like to drop stuff in New England. The point is we live in a culture of incredible change. And we often have identity crisis. Who am I now? My theme this morning is contrition and identity, new identity. Contrition, and we want to talk about what contrition is. Contrition is not guilt. It's not that. How do you figure out who you are in the modern world? Well, for many people, and if we follow the culture, it's self-assertion leads to new identity. It's about pushing, pushing against your limits, whatever your limits are, your limits of understanding, your limits at work. It's about pushing. It's about your drivers. It's about trying harder. And it's about not accepting your limits, really. There's an excellent book by Donald McCullough. McCullough was the president of San Francisco Theological Seminary for a time. And then he went into a crisis. I think he had a divorce and, and things didn't go well. But out of that very difficult time in McCullough's life, he wrote a very interesting book, which I've studied in a small group. And the title is interesting. It's The Consolations of Imperfection, Learning to Appreciate Life's Limitations. I love that. Many of us are perfectionists in many ways or about certain things. And this is an idea that celebrates limitations because sometimes God gives us limitations so that we can learn within a certain frame. McCullough raises questions about all of this. He suggests that the stronger identity grows out of making friends with our sadness and our hurt. He says that there are limitations in life and we... We crash into walls all the time, and we have to be realistic about what that means, that we're crashing into some difficulty, hitting the walls. There are even limits to optimism, and he has a chapter on that. <laughs> you know, it's funny the way the Europeans talk about Americans. I don't know if you're familiar, but that sometimes they laugh at our optimism because they say that our optimism is so shallow. And I think sometimes it is, in all honesty. What is our optimism based upon? You know, optimism can help you break through discouragement and break through care, uh, barriers in your life and move on to the, to the next thing and to believe in the future. But sometimes we deceive ourselves and we think human positive thinking is it. 
But biblical optimism is grounded on, on what God does and who God is and what God has promised, not upon human potential. There's no, nothing in the Bible about being optimistic because humans have this great potential. That's just not in there. There's an additional problem in our culture in the field of psychology and modern medicine, particularly as we live in the age of antidepressants where psychiatrists hand out depressants like candy. You know, we had Amy handed out candy. I think the modern, you should have been antidepressants on this last one, Amy. I think that might have been fitting. <laughs> you know, I don't know what color they are. They come in a lot of different colors. But in America, generally, it's not okay to be sad. You're not supposed to be sad in America. And psychiatrists kind of did this to us back in 1980 when they codified the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual, and they, they wanted to make everything scientific. So they took away the events of life, and they said, you know, there's these certain categories of depression, and if you're sad, then you're in one of these categories of depression, and then they pathologized it, and they said, there's something wrong with you. And there was one lady on the committee that said, well, wait a minute, you know, what if somebody passes away, or what if an event in your life happens and, and you're appropriately sad because of a de de developmental thing that happens. You know, you got old and you lost your ability to do something. Or, and they said, well, well, you know, and they kind of dismissed that and they put in one little part in the DSM that gave room for that possibility. But they didn't consider the whole of life and the reality of sadness. From a biblical point of view, this is completely wrong. We should feel sad, according to the Bible. We should grieve deeply over many things. It develops our character. And also, you know, there's another thing in today. People often feel bad about feeling bad. Like, we have this additional layer because of psychology. It's like, oh, I'm not supposed to feel sad, so there must be something wrong with me, so I better go get an antidepressant now. You know, maybe you're not supposed to feel bad about be feeling bad. Maybe you're supposed to feel sad. Maybe something sad has happened. That's the point. You know, if your children are hurting or if you're sinned, which is really what contrition is about, or you're looking at the sins of the world or the sins of our country, it should cause you grief. It should cause us pain. Not to feel guilty, not to go on a guilt trip, but to feel contrition so that we act, so that we change. Can't be happy all the time. You know, in the Bible, there's the book of Lamentations. I bet we've never heard a sermon series on Lamentations. I've never, I, you know, it's not popular. Did you, just, Amy doesn't want to hear it. I, <laughs> she works in that hospital. She has Lamentation all week long. Amy wanted to sit in the back row, but I made her sit in the front. Perhaps one of the greatest psalms in the Bible is Psalm 51. Perhaps you're familiar with it. This is David in his raw spirituality. David is stripped down. He's, you know, David has really messed up his life. You know the story, Bathsheba, Uriah, David has sinned. He killed a man, married his wife, and it didn't sink in for a long time, and he was in denial, and the prophet Nathan came to him and straightened him out. And then David went into a serious time of contrition, and it's here in Psalm 51. It's just there, David opened before me, for us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me out, O God. You should. You should kick me out of your, your kingdom, but don't. Peterson says, God, make a fresh start with me. I love this. And then Peterson says, translates it, shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Wow. Do you ever feel like there's chaos in your life, that things are just crazy? And the idea that God could create a genesis, order, bring beautiful order out of that. So can we bring our brokenness to God in prayer? David says, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. And that says to me two things. One, it says... We have to be open ourselves in prayer before God can heal us. And we, that openness makes us able to receive forgiveness. Some years ago, I was a part of an Alpha program. Alpha is a, 
is a great program, and perhaps the church should engage in it again. It's an outreach program of small groups where people share their faith, and you have dinner together, and you get to know people, and people share their lives and, and uh, share broadly across their lives and, and just kind of accept each other where they are. You know, it's, it's, it's not so much about the teaching. The, the teaching of the Word is there, but it's a lot. The curriculum is really the people. And there was a woman who came to Alpha that year, and, and she had gotten a divorce. She had had an affair, and she uh, divorced her husband, and she had a six-year-old and had not done a very good job of taking care of him. And she came to the Alpha program, and she prayed. We laid hands on her in the retreat, and it, it was a prayer of joy, a penitent. She, she said, I have messed up big time. And then she just received God's forgiveness. It was just magnificent, but broken, deeply broken. When we talk about contrition, we're talking about a word that's lost in the English language. Robert C. Roberts does a great job of defining it. He says there's two aspects. He says there's the logic of contrition and the lyric of contrition. He explains the logic this way in eight simple points. He says, contrition is recognizing that righteousness is good, excellent, and right. That I have culpably done wrong, thus I have hurt myself. That spoiled self is not the real me. In doing wrong, I have offended you, O God. I cannot escape your gaze, O God. You are merciful, you will forgive me, and I must amend my life. It's the repentance, the aspect of repentance and contrition, desire to change. All of these aspects are a part of it. And then, with the logic of contrition, and this is the part we often leave out with this, is the lyric of contrition. And this has really been the theme of this sermon series, is that we downplay emotions. We, we downplay, we, we think that if we understand everything and we get the right theology in our heads, our emotions don't matter in the Christian life, that they're just going to fall along like stupid children or something. No. Emotions are important. God wants to redeem our, our emotions, our whole self. It's not just our thinking. You know, you can think it right and still be really upset over here. God wants to shape us. So the lyric of contrition. And, uh, and with this, this is a little bit of a side, but I remember there was a Christian group some years ago that tried to take all the stuff out of fairy tales. I don't know if you had this. When my kids were little, this Christian group said, well, there's too many goblins in fairy tales, and there's too many witches, and there's too many mean people, and there's wolves, and there's all this stuff. We've got to take all this up and clean it up. We've got to clean up fairy tales. So they took everything out of the fairy tales, and they read them to the kids, and the kids were like... Where are the goblins and the witches and the stuff, you know? And in a sense, this is the kind of thing that, that we do. We, we sometimes we take the guts out of our religion. You know, they, the Episcopal prayer book in 1928, they had this prayer which they read every week, and I'm going to read it, and it sounds so archaic, but listen to this prayer as compared to the way we often pray today. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought and word and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. Thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry, sorry for those misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them intolerable. Now, if anyone prayed that prayer in the modern Christian church, they'd say, that pastor is a bummer. <laughs> Lighten up. Give us some fluff. We want fluffy religion, you know? We want religion that we can be happy with. I know it sounds archaic. But in the modern prayer book, you get, we're truly sorry, Lord. High five, Jesus. Truly sorry, Lord. <laughs> Try not to do it again, but, you know, next week we'll give you another high five. I mean, it just doesn't go very deep. It worries me. 
The lyric of contrition is that we feel the sadness of our spiritual condition. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, work out your salvation with contrite hearts. Feel the depth of it. Change. Repent. Turn your brokenness over to God. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. God is not done with us. God wants holy fear. I had a friend in uh, ministry, Tom Court. It's been some years since I worked with him. But Tom, Tom Court was really a Methodist. He, he made us wear the Presbyterian tabs. You know, we had the robes, and I don't know if you know the real Presbyterian outfit, but it's these, you know, you wear these choking collars with these two tabs here that are supposed to be the tongues of fire. It's what they wore back in the Reformation. We had to wear these things. They were horrible. But he really preached like a Methodist. And what, what it was, what he really believed that Christians could get better. He believed in the holiness movement. He believed that in sanctification. He believed that we were supposed to become more godly and more pure and more righteous and more like Jesus Christ. And he preached that every week. And his favorite saying, which he repeated all the time, is it's not who you are when someone is looking, but it's who you are when no one is looking that counts. I love that. It's not who you are when others are looking, but it's when no one is looking that counts. The stuff you do in secret. And that's essentially what Paul is saying here. He's saying, you know, I'm your spiritual mentor, but I'm out of town. You know, Philippians, I'm not with you. I'm not going to be watching over you. I'm out of town, so don't mess up. You know, just because I'm not here, take responsibility. Be pure, children of God. Now, I know that perfection is beyond us. My, my tone of preaching is exactly the opposite. You know, I, I look at the preaching that I've done over the last 10 years, and it's almost the same theme every week, celebrating our humanity and uh, that we need to accept ourselves and our brokenness and our humanity. But there's the other side. In order to find yourself in Christ, to live as a person in Christ, you need to know that the light of Christ is shining in you and that you want to be like Christ and you want to be the light of Christ in the world. And contrition is a part of that. It's, and it's not the same as confession. It's an awareness that your life is an open book before God and that God's holy presence surrounds you and that God wants to change you and make you more holy and shine like the stars in the universe. That's a beautiful expression. Paul says you're going to shine like the stars in the universe. Shine with God's holiness, brightness. You're going to be bright. The world's going to see it. Now, this is a rather blithe illustration, but my son-in-law, who I'm just getting to know, uh, who married my daughter Adeline, is going to be 30 in a few days. And uh, Michael is the son of a dentist. And so sometimes teeth come up, you know, I'll say something about my teeth. Now teeth come up a lot, you know, when Michael works for his father. And so I asked him the other day, I said, Michael, how many cavities have you ever had? And he said, none. I said, Michael, you're 30 years old, you've never had a cavity. He said, that's right. And I said, well, let's see, I get one every year and a half. Let's see, cutting back. I think I've had about 45. So I've got you beat, 45 to zero. And then my granddaughter, is, she's really interested in these mouth guards, so she sent an email to Michael the other day and wanted to, to know about his mouth guards. And so being Michael, being the dentist's son, he sent her back pictures. He has four mouth guards. I said, Michael, how could anyone have four different kinds of mouth guards? The guy has been in the dentist chair more times than anyone else in the universe. He has perfect teeth. But also Michael brushes. He flosses, he gargles, he chews on bark. I don't, know, I don't know what he does. He does everything. He's got the cleanest teeth you've ever seen in your life. My prayer for us, for you and I in the church, is that we don't give up on holiness. We don't give up on purity. We believe that God can really make us better. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for that you sent your son as our example. He taught us 
obedience, submission, holiness of life, what it really means to be pure and what it means to be good, what it means to be content in your presence. Give us special joy in your contentment and the desire to be your special children. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.